Good morning. This is Director Bishotsky. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Governor's Water Augmentation, Innovation, and Conservation Council. I'd like to remind everybody uh, that the meeting is being recorded. We can go to the next slide. Uh, here's the agenda for today's meeting. Uh, but before we move to introductions, I will ask Kennedy Shepard to again briefly review our webinar logistics. Kennedy, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, some webinar logistics before we get started. Please be sure to mute yourself when you are not speaking. If you are not a member of the council, we also ask that you keep your video turned off. If members of the council would like to speak, please type your name in the chat box and we will call you in the order your name appears to unmute and speak. Um, you may also type your questions or comments in the chat if you prefer. Uh, please send your messages to everyone so that we don't overlook them. Members of the public may be invited to submit questions or comments at the end of the agenda as time allows. If that is the case, we ask that you please hold your questions or comments until invited. Then either type your question or comment in the chat or indicate in the chat if you would like to speak. As the chair stated, this meeting and the conversations in the chat are being recorded. The recording is usually posted to the ADWR website within one to two business days. If council members or members of the public experience any technical difficulties, you may direct message me in the chat at ADWR host. Call the ADWR help desk at 602-771-8444 or email tickets at azwater.gov. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Kennedy, and again, welcome to the meeting. I'm Tom Bashovsky, the DWR director, director and council chair. DWR staff here with me today in the conference room are Clint Chandler, deputy director, Ken Slowinski, chief counsel, Carol Ward, Deputy Assistant Director, Jenna Norris, Governor's Water Council Coordinator, and Kennedy Shepard, Groundwater Users Advisor Council Coordinator. I will ask Jenna to call the roll for the council alphabetically. Please be prepared to unmute yourself and acknowledge your presence. Take it away. Okay, I will call each council member by order of last name. Boss Aha. Present. Director Lisa Atkins. Are you on? Representative Reginald Bolding. House Speaker Rusty Bowers. Present. David Present. Brown. Director Misael Cabrera. Good morning, everyone. Chris Camacho. Ted Cook. Present. Maria Dadgar. Good morning, this is Jay Tomkis, alternate for Maria Dadgar for the Intertribal Association of Arizona. Henry Day. Present. Ron Doba. Good morning, Ron Doba is present. Doug Dunham. Present, good morning. Sandy Fabric. Good morning. Kathleen Ferris. Chairwoman Amelia Flores. Grady Gamage. I am here. Bill Garfield. This is Terry Surasi. I'm sitting in today for Bill Garfield. Representative Gail Griffin. Good morning, I'm present. Art Harding from the governor's office. I am present. 
Spencer Camp. Jamie Kelly. Good morning, I am present. Senator Sine Kerr. John Kamek. Cheryl Lombard. Present. Edward Maxwell. <clears throat> Supervisor Stephen Miller. Present. Wade Noble. Here. Virginia O'Connell. Present. <laughs> Senator Lisa Otondo. Sarah Porter. Yes, I'm here. Dave Roberts. Good morning, I'm here. Governor Stephen Rowe Lewis. Kevin Rogers. Scott Deeney. Stephanie Smallhouse. Mark Smith. Present. Craig Sullivan. Good morning, Craig Sullivan, present. Warren Tenney. Good morning, I'm present. Smithy Tomir. Good morning, present. Philip Townsend. Chris Udall. Present. Jay Wetton. Okay. Thanks, Jenna, and again, welcome everyone. Good to at least hear your voices. Uh, I'd also like to recognize any other elected officials who are attending today. If there are some elected officials present that we have not called in the roll, uh, please unmute yourself now and let us know who you are, and now's the time for that. So any other elected officials? And I'll pause a second here. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Chairwoman Amelia Flores, Colorado River Indian Tribes, and um, it's good to be on this call and attending this meeting. Thank you for inviting me. Good morning, this is Jen Miles, Mayor of the City of Kingman. All right, not hearing others, I do uh, appreciate Chairwoman Flores. Uh, I think we missed you in the role, but uh, hopefully folks know that you are a newly appointed council member. We continue to look forward to working with you. So we will move on then uh, and get into our agenda. And the next item up is a presentation from Speaker of the House, Trustee Bowers, on the new Drought Mitigation Revolving Fund. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for offering to provide the Council an update on that fund, and welcome, and take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Director. And uh, it's good to see so many people interested in water and over consistent or a consistent interest for many years. And of course, it's heightened at this time, um, which was one of the reasons that I had 
approach the governor about a larger appropriation for water uh, in order to be able to take action if opportunity arose and in order to show Arizona's willingness that when we had monies available that we could spend them in a way or have them available for leveraging uh, with others projects to bring new water into the state of Arizona. Uh, and this that's a very important aspect. Uh, if you've read any of the accompanying information about the fund, and that it is not designed to find a way to take water from rural Arizona and to bring it into the three counties in the middle, but to bring other waters into Arizona in order to help with the demands of the large population centers, frankly. Uh, and uh, let me just review, we have $160 million uh, to that particular purpose uh, of mitigating drought by having waters available to bring out of state water into Arizona. We have a $40 million water supply development fund. And that is to for water projects and development of projects in rural Arizona and uh, with a method of reviewing that, et cetera. Uh, there's a $20 million drought contingency plan um, that we also have passed. That's for water infrastructure repayment. Uh, we have a $5 million water supply development fund uh, for identifying out of state water sources. So that would work in tandem or in, in uh, advance of expenditures from the drought mitigation revolving fund. Uh, we have uh, a $5 million water supply development fund for grants to Eastern counties, a million dollar water supply development fund to fund existing program needs. Uh, we have half a million for the Natural Resources Users Law and Policy Center. Uh, I, I believe that's at the U of A in order to support underrepresented small property orders or landowners in their water adjudication uh, preliminary um, legal document preparation, et cetera, not for legal representation, but to prepare them in an expeditious way so that they can get their information back in and in a proper form for review by the water master, Judge Harris and others. Um, and then we have a million dollars in a water protection fund, and those are for projects to conserve and protect water generally. And these are what were in this year's budget alone. Um, there are other funding from previous years of a much smaller scale, but these augment those and, and if we are still capable of doing so, we will be petitioning the legislature to make additional resources available in the future to give us leverage capability, uh, both uniquely to Arizona, but also with other states uh, depending on what sources could be developed to bring water here. The, the funds themselves, 49-19304, uh, uh, the Drought Mitigation Revolving Fund, the ADWR may award grants to facilitate the forbearance of water delivery that would avoid reductions in the state's Colorado River water supplies and that's not to exceed 10 million. So that would be available to DWR and to work with CAP, et cetera, in the mitigation uh, possibilities as needed. And I could see them working with uh, folks in the past who've made the monies available, environmental funds, uh, other water resources, private and public. Um, the state land department may also apply for grants to support the land department's ability to make the best use of water resources associated with state trust land. And the hope 
and the desire and the requirement is to augment the value of our state trust land with a secondary uh, opportunity to uh, use and develop the resources of water associated with those lands. And that's also not to exceed $10 million. And the board <clears throat> may also make low cost long term loans um, uh, available for those purposes, but also to in the uh, the low cost loans will be for planning and designing and constructing of, and financing of water supply arrangements and development projects to import water supplies from outside the state into the state. So I've made that point two or three times. And to be the, there will be a prioritization for loan applications that demonstrate the largest statewide benefit. And that's to to include up to at least 140 million. So um, there's also going to be the creation of a board. Statutorily, the board will be made, and the emphasis was <clears throat> that the board would be made up of members of all rural counties. They would have a membership capability uh, in order to emphasize the protection, frankly, um, of in-state water supplies and the advancement of out-of-state water supply uh, security to, to bring those up. So uh, we've split up <clears throat> the counties uh, in order to have a, a broad representation of rural folks. Uh, there'd be no more than two people from a combination of Maricopa, Pima, and Pinal counties, and that would be named by that that individual or those two individuals would be named by the governor and the Senate. There'd be not more than one person named from La Paz, Mojave, and Yuma County as an entity that would be named by the House of Representatives. Not more than one person from Cochise, Graham, Greenlee, or Santa Cruz. That would also be named by the House. Um, not more than one person from Gila or Yavapai. That would be named by the Senate. Not more than one person from Apache, Coconino, or Navajo County. To be named by the governor. And then the director of the natural water resources or his designee um, would be represented on the board and advisory members without the power to vote it would be the president of the senate the speaker of the house and the state land commissioner and that board would evaluate proposals brought uh, before it to see that it uh, fulfilled the requirements of statute and the desires and needs of the state of arizona and um, it's our hope to move forward and to, uh, we've already had some inquiries by companies north and east. We've in, been engaged in uh, with the uh, Consul General of Mexico in uh, strengthening and populating the committees that Tom works with, the director works with, and discussions have been opened um, with the governor of Sonora and with other companies uh, from Mexico who would like to be involved in any proposals dealing with desalination of the Sea of Cortez water. All of these things are not small endeavors. Um, anything stateside, we would, uh, we feel uh, that uh, Ms. Berman, your knowledge would be something that we would solicit to uh, guide how we would work with other states. And there have been studies, at least six studies done uh, federally on bringing water from floodwaters of the central states regions to the front range and then uh, dropping them over into the Colorado. 
my hope is that not only would we, if that were the case, that may be an option, but also that there may be a lower, uh, um, what would it be, latitude option that would allow water to come around and drop into the Gila um, so that we could get supplies more directly uh, into the Gila watershed and along into um, Canal County with the growing needs and demands in that region and then into the greater state. So there will be, uh, I anticipate into the future, decades of work in order to bring the new water supplies into Arizona. Um, I'm always using my plan of prayer and I'm very grateful for local monsoon uh, type water, but we know that the whole Western United States is in a drought and our hopes, prayers, and work will be dedicated to developing solutions both in state and multi state and even multinational in order to develop water supplies for our future growth and development. I know there's folks that poo poo all of this, that this is pipe and pipe dream stuff, and I say, congratulations, what's changed? Um, we can always be negative, but we don't get anything done uh, unless we're acting and looking for opportunities. And so uh, that's basically, Director, what I wanted to present to everybody, that that's uh, kind of an aerial view, not a lot of minutia, but of, of what we did in this budget and what we hope to achieve with everybody's work in augmenting water supplies in state, out of state, uh, using more wisely the water we have uh, and and uh, we're very grateful for the work that's been done and there's been a lot done by our municipalities and others in conserving and directing uh, water uh, and and so that's all i had and i'm i'd stand for any questions if they were uh, answerable at least i can always take a shot at it but i don't know if it'll be sufficient but thank you Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I guess I'd like to start before the questions. Are there any other legislators with us today that would like to uh, add anything to what the speaker said? I know many legislators supported this and were key in this moving forward as well. So I'll pause there for that and then we'll get into questions. So hearing none, any questions from any of the members of the council for the speaker? I noticed that there so was a, Mr. Shotsky, I noticed that we had as an option into the future, a bottled water tax and, and I'm willing to pay, but I sure need a drink right now. I've got a bottle of water hidden out of sight, though. <laughs> so I, I, will, I will say a few things. Um, the legislation requires DWR to support the board. Uh, we are ready, willing, and able to do that. Looking forward to the board getting stood up so we can start that process. I also want to say, Mr. Speaker, and to members of the legislature and the governor, thank you for the creation of this fund. In the 40, almost 40 years that I've been doing water issues in Arizona, this is one of the most impactful things that I believe the state of Arizona has done. It's already paying dividends, I believe. I had opportunity recently to speak to the seven basin state uh, representatives uh, and to Mexico and included a discussion of this fund in, in my discussions with them. And it was very positively received. They understand our water issues and what we're struggling with. They understand the size of the reductions we're, we will be taking in tier one uh, uh, next year, assuming we continue on that path, which is highly likely. And I think they were very impressed by the fact that all of you put this together. And it certainly showed to them the seriousness in which Arizona takes these issues and the willingness of us to partner with them potentially 
in some of these augmentation projects that might move water from out of the state into the state. So I really thank all of you for making this happen. Uh, the department uh, the, on the council's webpage uh, will we'll post uh, a summary of the fund, the monies, and some of the requirements and the membership of the board after this meeting. We started preparing that earlier today and we'll have it ready to post so everybody can access uh, that information. So unless there are other comments, Mr. Speaker, or questions from the council members, again, I thank you uh, for the presentation. Mr. Bushatsky, I would like to also, you touched on it, but I didn't touch on it enough. There's the support of the governor, and this is a huge um, step that he was totally supportive of from the get-go, without which support, obviously, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. So my, our gratitude should also be directed at him and his staff for smoothing this along and working it through. We were happy to work with you, Speaker. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So thank not you. hearing any other comments or questions, I think we're ready to a comment in the chat. But we have a comment in the chat, sorry. We have a comment from Warren Tenney. He says he agrees with the director's comments. This is a great positive step forward. Thank you, Speaker Bowers and legislators for your leadership on this. Thanks, Warren. And that is on the chat. So that was our one chat box comment. <laughs> so we will move on then to committee updates. And our first committee update will be from the co-chairs of the non-AMA Groundwater Committee, Representative Griffin and Jamie Kelly. You're up. Jamie, you want to jump in or do you want me to take it? Go ahead and start, Dale. Okay. All right. Well, as your notes show, uh, we did have several presentations on INAs. Uh, Representative Cobb made a presentation on establishing rural groundwater areas and discussion regarding the concept of rural groundwater area legislation. Uh, I did co uh, commit to go out to your area, which is Senator uh, Representative Cobb's area and take a look. Um, the original goals are still in place. Um, I think nothing new has has been happening except in in my area there is some um, interest in the San Simone area um, to maybe take another look at non-expansion irrigation district uh, that uh, that might be helpful for for them uh, there are local voluntary meetings uh, occurring as we speak uh, the uh, I just talked to one of the supervisors and she was in a meeting and we'll be making presentations and all the things that they're talking about doing voluntarily with with uh, recharge and trying to uh, uh, in fact she asked if that 40 million dollars uh, would be available uh, that program would be available and and i might add uh, for rural arizona it's capped at 1 million dollars per project it's a statewide program uh, we're hoping that the nat uh, natural resource conservation districts will be very involved in that since they have done the projects in Cochise County that have been very positive. And um, that particular million dollars is avail up to a million dollars per project. And there is $250,000 for planning or architectural design or what have you uh, available and the applications will be available, um, I guess, at the department uh, director. And uh, we're looking forward to that being a positive um, rural program for macro water harvesting projects so that we can actually put, put uh, water in the ground. Right now, uh, as I've mentioned before, several uh, hydrologists have told me that we're only recharging 5% of the rains that we get and uh, losing 95% to evaporation. So we're hoping we can take some of those waters and put them in the ground for recharge. 
So I think that's uh, what I have to report. Jamie, you want to jump in? I don't have anything to add. The committee itself has not met since last December. Right. Be happy to answer any Thank questions. And I might add, uh, we are out of session now. We had a six month session. Uh, we just got out the last day of June. It was long, but protective. We did a lot of good things and uh, look forward to implementing some of the things that we put in in statute. Thank you. Thank you both and, and Representative Griffin. I'll share with you that recently I had a discussion with one of my groundwater modeling hydrologists about uh, the issue of macro rainwater harvesting and uh, how much water does or how much of the rainfall does or doesn't make it into stream flow. It was an interesting conversation about information he believes is shown by uh, recent model updates in the Santa Cruz area and in the Prescott area. Um, and I would, uh, I'm going to reach out, I think, to Chairman Wade Noble of the Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee. And perhaps through that committee, we can further pursue uh, the policy issues and the technical issues related to that macro rainwater harvesting effort. I think in the summer of 2014, there was a legislatively created committee that never met. Things kind of fell by the wayside, but I believe it's time to reinitiate those discussions. And I know there are issues related to concerns over surface water right holders. But I think we need to start with a sound technical basis as to the viability of those programs and if there are potential impacts or not on those surface water right holders. And, and given this 20 year drought we're in and the issues we're facing uh, and piggybacking on to all the funding we just talked about, I believe we are in, we're at a point in time when we should resurrect that discussion in a meaningful way. And, and I'd it. love to hear anyone else's comments regarding what I just said. That's great. I think at one of our meetings, uh, we did present uh, information on just guttering, uh, <laughs> putting gutters around homes and how much water comes off of that roof and what we can do with it. Uh, and instead of evaporating, we can actually take advantage of it. Thank you. Good. We have a question in the chat. Can we read that question? From Jocelyn Given, will the committee be meeting again in the future and will there be any legislative hearings in rural Arizona this summer? I think I've heard uh, this. Uh, I'll jump into that. Uh, the speaker and I have talked about continuing our, our water meetings throughout the state and uh, uh, we just need to sit down with a calendar and, and make plans to do that. Uh, and yes, I look forward to, uh, I mean, now that we're out of session, uh, to having additional meetings for our committee. All right. Thanks, Representative Griffin and, and Jamie Kelly. And seeing no other questions or comments popping up in the chat box, we will move on to a report from the Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee and Chairman Wade Noble. Go ahead, Wade. Thank you. Uh, we note that our first slide shows when our next meeting is. The Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee has met once since the last council meeting. We met on June 29. The meeting focused primarily on the efforts of the Finance Subcommittee which has met several times over the course of re recent months to explore funding mechanisms for water infrastructure projects. Sandy Favorites provided an overview of the work of the Finance Subcommittee, noting that this topic has been taken up under prior commissions, but there hadn't been much headway in terms of major funding at the state level. Recognizing the recent efforts of Speaker Bowers, Representative Griffin, and others to include major water funding for aug water augmentation, 
projects into the budget, the subcommittee wanted to review past and existing mechanisms in Arizona, as well as what other states have done. To assist the subcommittee, Vanitha Kartha compiled a draft report that identifies previous actions taken by the state, mechanisms used by other southwestern states and other countries, and federal funding to document what is possible. She reviewed that report with the committee. Sandy Favorites discussed the $200 million included in this year's budget, noting that it is unprecedented at the state level and will be extremely helpful in providing matching dollars for available federal funding and allowing those funds to be more fully leveraged. She noted as well that there is a potential for private-public partnerships. Slide. The subcommittee recommended supporting and continuing to build on the current combined $200 million in the Drought Mitigation Revolving Fund and the Water Supply Development Fund by providing a consistent and dedicated funding source annually in subsequent state budgets to ensure Arizona can meet its water needs into the future. Slide. Daniel D'Alessi of the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority described the state revolving funds and the planned implementation of the state's water supply development fund. Slide. Carol Ward of ADWR provided an update on the work of the storage site subcommittee. The subcommittee was formed to assist ADWR in identifying criteria for the selection of potential underground storage sites for the possible revision of the joint ADWR and State Land Department report titled Potential Water Storage Sites on ASLD Trust Land that was required by session law and completed in 2017. Representative Griffin passed a bill this session requiring a new report by December 31 of 2021, and that was signed into law. Working with the subcommittee, Representative Griffin, and the Storage Sites Committee, ADWR, and ASLD expanded the report to include 331 potential underground storage sites on state land. The report has been finalized and is ready to submit. As the result of the discussions with Representative Griffin, the subcommittee, stakeholders, and ASLD, and with their input and assistance, ADWR has also developed a guide to assist stakeholders at the local level in winnowing down potential sites to those that will suit their specific needs and capabilities. The sections of the guide step the user through the process of site selection, progressing from high-level checklist items to more in-depth items that may require a consultant as the project begins to solidify. The draft guide was completed in late June and shared with the committee for feedback. Comments are due this Friday, that is tomorrow, July 16. ADWR staff hopes to have the document formatted and posted to the council by the end of, the, of July. Just, you know, as questions are being formulated, and I'm sure there are lots of them coming that I'll pass on to someone else, but we really appreciate the department's support for the committee and the subcommittees in the things that we have been doing. Thank you, Wade. And, and before we move on in relation to the guide, we are working on that. We're working to make it as streamlined as possible so that it will be as useful as possible for the layperson to follow. Uh, we're still waiting, as we said, to hear from uh, folks about comments. Uh, we will make sure uh, that we incorporate those important comments into the final version of the guide. So other questions, questions or comments for Wade? And we'll make him answer and not pass it off. <laughs> Anything in the chat? Currently nothing in the chat. Thank you, Wade. To all we'll my friends on. on the council, I appreciate you so much for holding on the questions. <laughs> they're going to wait, wait till we meet in person, I think, and then they're all going to come. <laughs> so next, we'll go to the desalination uh, committee uh, and a report from Chairman Henry Day. Henry, you're up to bat. Thank you, Director Bruchotsky. Uh Members of the council, 
Uh, I uh, am glad to be able to report the activities of the desalination committee. Please uh, uh, advance to the background slide. Well, there we go. Okay, the legal and regulatory subcommittee of the governor's council desalination committee was chaired by Scott Miller. And they were tasked to identify legal and regulatory barriers to increase use of brackish or poor quality groundwater in Arizona. The subcommittee met initially in October of 2019. Following that meeting, they prepared a summary paper and sent it to subcommittee members for comment. This document is found on our subcommittee website. Comments were received and discussed at subsequent meetings of the desalination committee on March 25th, 2021. Following our discussion points, including consensus and differing opinions. Next slide, please. So we identified in this committee that there are no legal or regulatory constraints specific to use of brackish or poor quality groundwater in Arizona law. Brackish or poor quality groundwater is not specifically defined in Arizona statute. In discussion, some committee members felt that a legal definition of poor quality groundwater could encourage beneficial use of a currently underutilized water source. Others saw no need to define poor quality groundwater, preferring the one water approach. And there was little agreement in the committee concerning what currently constitutes beneficial use of poor quality groundwater. Most of the legal and regulatory barriers to increase use of brackish groundwater were identified by the subcommittee and there are limitations on use or transportation of groundwater. The Arizona Trans Groundwater Transportation Act of 1991 prohibits transportation of groundwater to another basin or subbasin or from outside of an AMA into an AMA unless specifically authorized with certain well-known exceptions in McMullen Valley, Butler Valley, Park Bahala INA, and Big Chino subbasin. Arizona law classifies all aquifers in the state as drinking water aquifers and prohibits degradation of water quality in those aquifers. This effectively prohibits use of deep well injection for the disposal of waste streams from desalination of poor quality groundwater supplies. Deep well injection currently requires an underground injection permit from the EPA and an APP from ADEQ. Next slide, please. There are exceptions. Two sections within the code reference use of poor quality groundwater, enabling use of groundwater beyond what would otherwise be allowable within AMAs. Arizona Revised Statute Section 45132 prohibits filling or refilling bodies of water for landscape, scenic, or recreational purposes. However, a person can apply to the director for a permit to use poor quality groundwater for that purpose. And Section 45516 also allows for the issuance of poor quality groundwater withdrawal permits. Next slide, please. The subcommittee focused considerable discussion on an area in the Phoenix AMA commonly known as the Buckeye waterlogged area. Within this area, because of the shallow depth of water, irrigators have historically dewatered in order to sustain agricultural activities. Next slide, please. So these are discussion points of the subcommittee. The subcommittee discussed both means and desirability of enabling additional groundwater use by leveraging exemptions for poor quality groundwater permits and removing limitations imposed by groundwater code or transport statutes. So among the points discussed, positions taken, one, expanding exemptions for groundwater use or incentivizing use of groundwater supplies conflicts with the purpose of the Groundwater Management Act. Two, poor quality water is no less valuable than potable water. Charting this water as less valuable or as if it is not available to someone else is not a good path forward. Three, if poor quality groundwater is withdrawn in any large quantity in excess of what is already used, it may affect another user's physical availability. Brackish groundwater is still groundwater and is already relied upon. 
and four, additional poor quality groundwater pumping could lower water levels, forcing current users to deepen their wells, creating economic hardship. And I'm gonna conclude this portion of the presentation by stating that the subcommittee was tasked with identifying legal regulatory barriers to increase use of brackish water, and they have done so. Thanks to Scott Miller and to the committee members for the work that they did on this project. Issues remain. Transportation restrictions were identified that could be reconsidered on a case specific basis in the future. Uh, similarly, deep well injection could be investigated if a need develops, but it's certainly going to take more work. Finally, expanding exemptions or incentivizing use of poor quality groundwater was debated by the committee. The committee was not tasked with resolving differences of opinion, only with presenting all the opinions. That concludes this portion of the presentation, if there's any questions. Questions from council members for Henry. Seeing nothing in the chat. Uh, this is Rust, Rusty. I'd like to know where we go from here. I mean, you weren't, we had, uh, you weren't tasked to do more than just have an expression of opinions all around, which are important and usually based on some type of interest or principle. But in a, in a view that all water has a value, I'm wondering where, what would be the next step or steps that might be contemplated? Thank you uh, for that question, um, Speaker Bauer. Uh, the committee, this particular report today is on a subcommittee of the broader committee that had a relatively narrow task. The next portion of this presentation is going to be talking about future steps that the committee plans to take to investigate. Uh, and if acceptable, I'll continue with this presentation. And if at the end you still have that question, I'll be glad to uh, make an effort to answer it. Thank you for pointing out the obvious. I need to, I need to hold an agenda in front of my face more often. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. And next slide, please. And one more. So uh, this uh, goes to the question, what are the next steps for the desalination committee? We all understand that there is a large quantity of in-state brackish and saline groundwater that is available for us to explore and investigate how to use. The committee, this committee was tasked to evaluate the feasibility of developing additional desalination projects to augment water supplies in Arizona. That is our written mission of this committee. Numerous possibilities were evaluated and many were found to be impractical at this time. In some cases, due to technological reasons, in some cases, due to legal, legal constraints, but uh, almost certainly the largest is cost constraints because groundwater can be treated. Groundwater is currently treated in some West Valley cities and is used. Um, how, and, and other cities are contemplating doing that very thing. But there are certain costs associated with it. There are also brine disposal concerns that relate to this. Uh, so the committee uh, recognizes that there are um, still opportunities in the future. And so I wanna talk about a couple of those. One that the committee will certainly do is <clears throat> evaluate technological improvements uh, that will enable cost-effective rec recovery and beneficial use. So we will continue to work with groups like the Multi-State Salinity Coalition. We'll look at new technologies and we will make efforts to uh, understand uh, uh, what may become available for people to consider in the future. A second approach is that we want to look at the potential loss of current supplies due to degradation. And we feel in this committee that it's equally important to conserve and protect 
existing supplies as it is to find new supplies of water. The Central Arizona Salinity Study, TAS, was a group that met from about 2002 to 2006, and they identified a buildup of salts in soils and in groundwater. Next slide, please. This is one of the primary slides that CAS came up with. It shows the study area, which is basically Phoenix to Tucson. Uh, it, it includes the Gila Bend and Hacienda area. And evaluation of wells, it showed that there was a uh, there was increasing TDS in wells as you move westward in the valley, as we're all familiar with. Next slide. So some of the cast made a number of predictions. This was a four year, $2 million study. It was led by the United States Bureau of Reclamation, and it was supported by many of you, by central Arizona cities, by water providers, by consultants, by NGOs. And I'm going to mention a few of the conclusions of that study. They concluded that 1.1 million tons per year of salts are building up in the Phoenix metro area, 40% in groundwater, and approximately 100,000 tons per year in the Tucson metro area. The projection was that by 2040, the Phoenix metro area would increase to 1.85 million tons per year degrading groundwater. Certainly drought conditions uh, will increase salt concentration in surface water supplies, such as the Colorado River, the Salt Verde and Gila Rivers, a well understood concept. They did a model, they, in their model, they projected what's the cost for each 100 million milligram per liter increase in surface, in, uh, surface water cost, and in Phoenix, that cost was identified as $30 million per year. Maricopa County, $94 million per year for each 100 milligram per liter increase in surface water TDS. Another conclusion was that contributors of TDS to wastewater collection systems, municipal, industrial, and commercial contributors were not constrained by pretreatment local limits or by disposal fees. Another conclusion, water softener usage in the valley will increase from current levels contributing to increased TDS in wastewater treatment plant effluent. And they noted in 2004 that 26% of homes in Phoenix Metro used water softeners, but newer homes had 51%. And finally, municipal wastewater treatment plants could develop chronic or acute biomonitoring issues and evidence of such toxicity was demonstrated in a study by the city of Phoenix at the Cave Creek Water Reclamation Plant. Uh, next slide, please. So, cast trends 20 years later, we all have to ask ourselves how much of this was speculation? Are any of these predictions coming true? Is it an issue for us to consider now? Is it one for five years from now? Is it one from 20 years from now? Certainly, source water TDS is increasing due to the drought. How much and what are the impacts of that? Has treated effluent quality degraded? Treated effluent is being stored in the ground for future use by many cities in the area and is certainly a valuable future source that we want to make sure that it is properly protected. Is groundwater quality degrading? So the proposal that our committee is making is that we will assemble a team of interested parties to reconsider the high level conclusions of the CAST studies. And by that, I don't mean that we're going to validate their economic analysis model, but what we can do is evaluate current well data and compare it then and now and look for trends. We could look at water softener proliferation. We could look at wastewater treatment plant TDS trends across the study area. Are there biomonitoring issues developing? And if appropriate, after doing this evaluation and reviewing the data, we may want to consider further investigation and would bring that back to this council for consideration. The remainder of activities by this committee, by the desalination committee, are that we will continue to evaluate technological advancements that may enable cost-effective 
beneficial use of saline or brackish groundwater here in Arizona. And that is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. I guess I'll first turn to Speaker Bowers to hear if from him if his question was uh, answered sufficiently by this part of the presentation. Then we'll turn to others. Um, I believe so, and thank you. And but it sure fires up some more questions about like water softeners. Wow, fifty-one percent of new homes have water softeners in them, and I'd like at some time to find out what the percent of or the contribution rate of salinity in as it's growing uh, would be attributable to water softeners. And would that change appreciably if the drought changed and we were able to and we were had more water? I don't just general questions. Thank you. And Mr. Speaker, I know some number of years ago and I can't remember the exact time frame, but it was before 2011. I know there was discussions uh, about potential legislation uh, regarding water softeners and potentially, um, I'll use a horrible word, banning certain technologies that contributed more salt than less salt. And maybe we can dig that up here and get it to the committee. And maybe there are some folks in the committee membership that remember uh, that discussion. I do not recall that any legislation was actually dropped at the legislature, but I know there were discussions uh, among the water buffalo, so to speak, about that issue. Sure. Sure, thank you. So we'll, we'll help look into that, and, and if any of the members can help us out there, shoot an email to Carol if you have some info on that in that regard. I'll also suggest, Henry, that evaluating the technology in terms of uh, desalination. There may be some helpful information from the binational work group in the Mexico process in the report that was published in June of 2020, uh, that appraisal type level report looking at potential desal in the Sea of Cortez. I know several different technologies were analyzed by the consultants in that report, although to some degree I believe it's somewhat site specific in terms of where you're going to put the desal plant in terms of what's the best technology and also obviously the level of TDS in the water and also the brine disposal kind of all plays into that. But that can be a place to look maybe by the committee at information in that technical report and we can help you dig that report. It's on the International Boundary and Water Commission website and we probably have a copy of that somewhere here in DWR. Thank you, Director. I will. Uh, uh, I I have reviewed portions of that report, but I would like to uh, look at it further. And I appreciate your support there. Any other questions or comments by committee members? Sandy Fravitz would like to speak. Go ahead, Sandy. You can unmute yourself, I believe. Yes, thank you, Director, and thank you, Henry, for the presentation. Um, you know, this is in this talking about brackish groundwater. Um, this is an area that I've, I've struggled with for many years. Um, it's still groundwater. It's it does impact physical availability. I think is what you said, Henry, um, for assured water supply purposes. And so, I guess. You know, incentives to utilize this source of water, if any, has the committee sort of outlined, well, you did give sort of an update or sort of a general um, list of, of potential negatives associated with this, but given the recent media attention on groundwater declines across Arizona, is this something, I guess, really that the that the commission wants to promote um and you know for additional i don't know whether it's additional incentives or or whatnot it's just the balance doesn't seem to fit uh with what the objectives are um and so that i guess i'm just struggling with that and i would like to hear from other committee members 
or the or the director to see what your thoughts are on that. I uh, I understand your question, Sandy, and thank you. Uh, you're right that current and future assured water supply portfolios are taking into account uh, brackish groundwater, uh, and there are many questions about that uh, about beneficial use. Does it require treatment? Can it be blended? Um, certainly the some of the some of the bigger concerns are if it is treated and withdrawn how will um uh, uh bride be disposed uh after that point in time certainly those are are large issues that we'll continue to deal with i think it was pretty much the consensus of the committee that we weren't prepared to recommend any particular uh incentives or changes to utilize groundwater, but simply to brackish groundwater, but simply to recognize that it has value, it has long term value uh, in our water supply here in Arizona. Depending on who you ask, some would tell you that there are millions of acre feet of brackish groundwater available in Arizona to be developed and used in future water supplies. And I think the key there is probably future because most of the constraints at this point in time, although some are uh, legal in nature, more there is more of a constraint on cost. And right now it costs more to develop brackish groundwater, therefore people aren't doing it. That doesn't mean it won't be part of our long-term water strategy. Uh, and as technologies improve, I believe we are gonna come to a point where we'll do more reclamation of a currently somewhat underutilized resource. Yeah, and I guess really my question really goes to is are we if the commission supports some sort of approach on this, are we promoting it as an additional source or a, a replacement source for, you know, perhaps cleaner or more fresh uh, groundwater supplies? Um, because if it's an additional source, then it's just an additional demand on the aquifer and, you know, an achievement of the management goals is, or outside if it's outside an AMA, you know, it, it, promoting the use of it, it leads to, you know, increase or decreases in water levels. Um, it's really more of a philosophical I, question on do we is this really where we want to go? Yeah, I think I would view um, brackish and saline groundwater as an existing source that is available. Uh, in Arizona to be developed in time and as appropriate. Certainly, I'm not uh, advocating increasing groundwater withdrawals, certainly not right now at a point in time where we're looking at a potential shortage on the Colorado River and there's a potential for um, return to groundwater usage, which I uh, certainly believe is a poor strategy. So Sandy, I'll just weigh in on a couple of things. And in discussions with my staff who have participated in the committee meetings, my understanding is that they're under the current legal and regulatory framework, there are sufficient ways to utilize brackish groundwater and, and to desalinate it. Um, and it gets to, I think, the last issue that Henry brought up in terms of mining groundwater and what are the long-term impacts if you have a more permissive, I'll call it, regulatory structure. I think folks are struggling with that uh, in general. I'll also say in terms of uh, poor quality groundwater permits that I believe there is a lot of ambiguity in the current statutory framework. I think the director is to consider approving a permit when the water has no other beneficial use. And, and that gives the director a lot of flexibility and leeway to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but there's that's not a very clear and concise definition. And, and Henry hit one of the points. Does that mean with blending? Does that mean unblended? Uh, if you have one water user in an area that drinks this highly saline water, which is a beneficial use, does that preclude the approval of a permit? 
And for full disclosure, there is a permit request before me um, that I think is in an objection phase, if that's correct. And it's at the Office of Administrative Hearings in terms of my decision. So uh, that is out there. Uh, we'll be interested to see what the hearing officer has to say when that hearing occurs. Uh, so there are lots of different uh, tentacles to this issue. Um, and hopefully the committee can help us work through them. And I am still assuming that the council as a whole wants the committee to continue to look at these issues and maybe to further synthesize them and maybe if the charge isn't coming up with recommendations today, perhaps that's what the recharge should be moving forward. And I know we have lots of other comments in the chat, so I'm going to turn now to, to those comments and have those read and listen to those folks. Okay, so first we have... So first we have Tim from the City of Phoenix. Uh, he said the City of Phoenix did a water softener impact study about 10 plus years ago. And Dr. Peter Fox at ASU and I did some research on alternative technologies, alternates to ion exchange. Uh, Kathleen Ferris says, I agree with Sandy, very difficult to isolate this source. And Warren Tenney would like to make a comment. So I was just wanting to I was going to say what Sandy ended up um, pointing out is the, the brackish groundwater is ultimately groundwater. And so is it is it for the purpose of looking at an additional source augmenting a, a supply? Um, usually when we look at augmentation, it is at renewable sources and groundwater being finite it, that then becomes problematic. But however, it is a it is there, and if it's meant to be as a replacement or to be able to utilize in times of need, um, as had been envisioned uh, with uh, with the Groundwater Management Act, then then you know it makes sense to be looking at some of the technology so that it can maybe be utilized. But I would be concerned that since it is groundwater and with all of the other pressures that are on groundwater that we have in the AMA, in the Phoenix AMA, as well as throughout the whole state, um, I, I would be very concerned about going down a path where we're trying to define brackish groundwater in a way that it becomes, would be viewed as a new source or an additional su supply of water. Thank you. All right, then we have a question from Mark Spencer. Can the al alternate technologies be named easily, Tim? Hello, this is Tim. I'm putting some information in the chat. Um, template assisted crystallization or TAC was the best performing technology in that study, but there were other technologies also evaluated, including electromagnetic. And our final comment from Sarah Porter, she said, I would like to see the committee develop further the, quote, one water view that incorporates brackish groundwater. And that is all we have in the chat. So this is Director Bashotsky. I do want to mention so it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. I believe in prior discussions, uh, we heard from our constituents in the Yuma area concerns raised about what is the legal nature, and wait, I hopefully I'm getting this right, what is the legal nature of that underground water in the Yuma area that's highly saline and concerns about potentially that water being developed through desalination and transported away from the Yuma area? Did I get that right, Wade? Yes, you did. There are concerns about that, and uh, I'm not sure. Those situations evolve, and uh, the way we think about it here in Yuma changes a little bit from time to time, especially as the drought continues. So I can't say that uh, the positions we took just a few years ago about needing to work out the legality of the groundwater under the mound 
uh, are the same today, but there are things that we continue to look at. Director. So given the discussion, oh, yes, go ahead, sorry. Uh, this is Gail Griffin. Uh, that was going to be my, my comment was depending on where it's at. The question is, who does it belong to? And not just in the Yuma area, other areas as well. Those questions come up. Yeah, so I, I will ask, is it the uh, view of the committee? Uh, sorry, the view of the whole council that we should ask the committee to further flesh out these issues uh, as we discussed and, and come up with uh, some more clarity and potentially some more recommendations on moving forward. Is that the want of the entire council? And, and if if I hear no no comments, I'll take that as as yeses. So I guess I'm asking for more of the noes than the yeses. But happy to hear from the yeses too. I say yes. This is Rusty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Theodore Cook says yes. Jamie Kelly says yes. Thank you. This is Wade. So I certainly. Some, yes. This is Wade. Ahead, I Wade. certainly agree that we need to get busy, especially on the legal issues, and uh, get those figures out figured out because it is something that is a statewide question now, but particularly out here on the river, we need to be looking at what the status is so that we can move forward on it. This is Griffin. I agree with the yes. This is Phil Towns. I agree with the yes. Uh, Doba says yes. Lisa Atkins says yes. And Kathleen Ferris says I would like ADWR's lawyers to look at the legal issues. So hearing hearing nothing else and seeing nothing else in the chat, I think the consensus is yes to move forward. We'd be happy to have our lawyers give a presentation to the committee on the current status of the legal issues related to brackish groundwater. Uh, our view, both within the AMAs and outside the AMAs, as we just discussed. But it sounds like, Henry, you have an additional uh, set of marching orders for your committee. Uh, and happy to have our staff and folks that you work with you to flesh out how to move forward uh, in achieving the goal that the council is asking you to achieve. Thank you, Director. We'll move in that direction. Thank you. Any other closing comments or questions on this issue? We just have some more yeses. I, I hear we have a bunch of more yeses. <laughs> so thank you everybody for weighing in. We'll move on for time's sake to the post 2025 AMA committee uh, and a report from co-chairs Warren Tenney and uh, Cheryl Lombard. And I guess Warren, you're going to carry the ball. Yes, thank you. So appreciate this opportunity to give an update about the post 2025 committee. As you remember in March, the committee co-chairs presented to the council an overall report about the six issues that the post 2025 AMA's committee had worked on for the previous year and a half. At that meeting, Tim Tomier stepped down as co-chair and Cheryl Lombard stepped up as the new co-chair. Since then, Cheryl and I have been working together on how best to move the committee forward and have mapped out the best way to guide the committee to develop strategies and solutions. Cheryl and I have worked together before, so I appreciate the perspective and experience she brings to looking at these post-2025 issues. Uh, this week, Cheryl is on a well-deserved vacation, but as, as already indicated in the chat room, she decided to still tune in for uh, this meeting. 
she and I worked together on what I would share for this uh, update. So next slide, please. As we've previously discussed, the post 2025 AMA's committee is charged with identifying opportunities or challenges to groundwater management within the active management areas, and then coming up with strategies and solutions to address those challenges beyond 2025. During its initial 18 months, the committee focused on the first phase of its goal to identify and document issues. Next slide. Over the course of several well-attended meetings, the post-2025 AMA's committee identified six areas of opportunities for water management in the AMAs. The committee developed for each issue an issue statement along with a written brief to further describe the issue. At the Council's March meeting, the committee co-chairs presented and described the six issues listed on the screen. The committee acknowledges these issues are interconnected, which will mean solutions and strategies may overlap one or more of the issues. Plus, strategies will need to be assessed in relation to the immediate and long-term needs and consequences of the challenges presented in each of the six briefs. Following the discussion with the Council in March, which included some differing perspectives expressed about the issues, the Council did charge the committee to move to its next phase. So today we are explaining how we are proceeding into this solutions phase. Next slide. Cheryl and I have identified two objectives as we move into this solution phase. First, we want to develop specific strategies and solutions to these post-2025 challenges to water management in the AMAs that can be implemented within the next year and a half during Governor Ducey's administration. Although it's a time, tight time frame, this Water Council was established by Governor Ducey, and so we want to be sure that we meet the charge given us and accomplish something during this time. Under this short time frame, we must be realistic about what policies can be supported and implemented to best address how we manage water in the AMAs. Our second objective is to have a discussion on broader, longer term strategies and solutions so that the groundwork is laid and we have a momentum to continue our collective stewardship over water with the next administration. Next slide. We decided it would be best to focus first on developing solutions for three of the issues that have a common nexus across all the AMAs. Groundwater in the Assured Water Supply Program, unreplenished groundwater withdrawals, and the hydrologic disconnect. These three issues affect all sectors and stakeholders across all AMAs and are intertwined. We have been working with ADWR to pull together additional information and data relevant to furthering our understanding about these three issues that will be presented to the committee. These presentations are meant to set the stage for a more informed discussion with the committee to discuss these issues, ask questions, and suggest ideas for solutions. Next slide. So what about the remaining issues? We are asking a group of Prescott AMA stakeholders to look at how best to address the exempt wells issues and how it is inter interrelated with other management structure issues in the Prescott AMA. The group would then present concepts they have developed to the committee for further discussion. Regarding the issue on CAGRD replenishment and water supplies, the co-chairs the co feel that while this is a post-2025 issue identified by the committee, it is not an immediate problem for the CAGRD, and the CAGRD is continuously planning for and seeking to address this matter. The CAWCD board is also aware of and considering the implications raised in the issue brief. That issue brief explained the growing risk after 2025 
of obtaining water supplies to meet the CAGRD's replenishment obligations. Obtaining new supplies is also a challenge for all water providers, so we believe the broader issue of augmentation can be addressed with the continued work of the Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee as well as of the Council as a whole. Finally, as we discuss the first three issues, potential solutions or strategies may be best executed by making improvements to the AMA management structure. The AMA management structure issue provides an opportunity to review and implement changes to the broader regulatory framework, which, will plan, which we will address if we haven't already after discussing the first three issues. Next slide. So we have a tight time frame, and we know we need to have a process that will best generate ideas for solutions and strategies. While the three issues are interrelated, Cheryl and I believe we will be most productive by starting off with single issue presentations and discussions with the committee while accom uh, accommodating and understanding when they are across issue comments or ideas. So the committee did meet on June 22nd and discussed groundwater in the Assured Water Supply Program. ADWR staff gave a presentation about assured water supply issues and what it means for AMA management. Committee members then asked questions and shared ideas to address this issue. We plan to meet again August 10th to discuss the issue unreplenished groundwater withdrawals. ADWR will give a presentation about the current scale and impact of each type of unreplenished groundwater withdrawals in the AMAs. Again, we will have a discussion about strategies to address this issue. And then in September, we will discuss the hydrologic disconnect issue. We will have a presentation that gives more information about where hydrologic disconnect is and is projected to occur. The committee will discuss the issue as well as look at how it overlaps with the other issues that we discussed in August and in June. We will keep track of the ideas for solutions that are suggested. And at the September meeting of this council, we will report on those three presentations and possible ideas that have been proposed by the committee to address the issues. Next slide. We plan for the committee to continue to meet between October and December so that we can discuss which ideas are most realistic to develop further into solutions that would lead to supported policy changes. We would then present to the council in December any policy proposals that we have general consensus on with the committee. Going into 2022, the committee would continue dialogue on the issues and further consider ideas for solutions and strategies that may not have yet been developed by the committee. For now, our focus is on 2021 and to have spirited committee discussions to develop new ideas and approaches to these issues that we can build support around and continue to have strong water management well beyond 2025. We all know a lot of attention is being placed on Arizona as we approach a tier one shortage. Water is a hot topic as evidence, not just from all the media stories, but from the questions I've been asked, and I'm sure you've been asked by friends and family. My response is to tell them we are not facing a crisis but that a tier one shortage is part of an overall plan for managing the Colorado River, and we have prepared for this moment. Over the decades, we have planned, managed, conserved, and invested in all of our water supplies. That is exactly what we must continue to do as we face what appears to be a drier, hotter future. We are all in this together which is all the more reason for us to work together. I'm confident we can develop together solutions that will address groundwater challenges in the AMAs, as well as tackle the other water issues that we face. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Thanks, Warren. Are there questions or comments from <clears throat> council members uh, for Warren? We have a um, comment in the chat from Kathleen Ferris. I am concerned that it may be impossible to address groundwater and the assured water supply program without talking at the same time about CAGRD replenishment obligations. The reason we can grow on groundwater is because of CAGRD. So I'll just uh, say to that point as well, one of the issues that I believe everyone is aware of in Pinal County, in the Pinal Active Management Area, is the physical availability of groundwater issue and the unmet demand that is identified in DWR's model and in the discussions with first the legislative committee and, and now the Pinal stakeholder group. The lack of physical availability really serves in my mind as a backstop against the growth of the CAGRD. If you can't prove physical availability, uh, then you can't join the CAGRD. So those issues are definitely linked. And perhaps, Kathy, I think that's part of the discussion that needs to be had as you brought up in talking about assured water supply issues, groundwater, and the GRD kind of collectively as Warren brought up that is, all of these things are definitely connected. Other questions or comments? I just, I just this is Gail. Yes. Okay. Um, just, just a comment. I appreciate the printout that I got that reminds us all that the Groundwater Act uh, was enacted to conserve, protect, and allocate the groundwater resources of the state in order to protect and stabilize general economy, as well as welfare of the state and citizens. So, uh, successfully groundwater overdraft uh, across a series of series of five management plans, um, and most of the AMAs have not met their goals. Uh, the final management period closes in 2025 uh, and continues until the legislature takes action. So the economy and jobs for the state of Arizona is very important. And, and so I'd, I'd like to see how we can help the AMAs reach their goals without hurting their economies and, and come up with solutions uh, to those issues. Thanks, Representative Griffin. Any other comments? Anything else in the chat? Yeah. So, Representative Griffin, you've given me the perfect segue into the next agenda item. And I want to give some background before we get into this. And this is something that I thought needed to be discussed in front of the entire council and not necessarily uh, referred to the post-2025 AMA committee. And I'll, I'll talk about my reasoning for that. And, and first, we've heard about the hotter, drier future. Maybe that higher, drier future is already upon us, as evidenced by the fact that in the Colorado River Basin this year, we got 89% of the normal precipitation and 30% of the runoff due to hotter and drier conditions, uh, which resulted in that precipitation not making it into the river. Um, a huge issue for us, and we've seen this in past years on the river as well. So just as importantly, I think you all know that DBR has been working on the fifth management plan uh, and have a deadline to get that in place uh, adopted in 2023, so the re regulatory requir requirements would be effective in 2025. Uh, we. I think you all know DWR had fallen behind in the promulgation and creation of those management plans, specifically the fourth and fifth plan. Uh, as we've been working through the fifth plan, and we've had many, many, many public meetings, I think the one consistent thing we've heard in all the public meetings is um, this process is moving quickly. We would love to have had more time uh, to interact and DWR certainly agrees that we would love to have more time to interact. And in that vein, I wanted to address 
potentially the future past the fifth management plan and have a discussion about uh, is there a pathway for the establishment by the legislature of requirements for additional plans? And if so, the sooner we know that, I think the better we can begin to work on that sixth, seventh, or eighth, or whatever the plans are, and, and give the stakeholder community, the regulated community, that amount of time to work with us that they really deserve to have. And so I had talked with Representative Griffin, obviously ahead of the council meeting, and when she was in the Senate in 2018, she had some legislation uh, addressing a, an additional management plan. And at the same time, uh, DWR had a proposal. Uh, no legislation, I think, was created around that proposal. So we wanted to share those proposals with you and then get feedback perhaps from the council about does the council as a whole want to suggest uh, moving forward? So with that introduction, I will turn to Representative Griffin uh, to talk about her uh, Senate Bill 1512. Representative Griffin. You might be muted, Representative Thank you. Griffin. I got it. Thank you. Uh, Thank in you. 2000, 2018, there were quite a few water bills that didn't make it through the system for one reason or another. Um, and so I have pulled all of those water bills and are reviewing them to see uh, if uh, if any of them would, would apply for today, uh, for next year. Uh, I haven't gone through them all, and uh, but I uh, suggest that everybody pull the, the 1512 uh, House uh, Senate Bill 1512 in 2018 and review it and get back to us. Um, as I mentioned before, of course, the the fifth management plan remain plan remains in place until the legislature determines otherwise. So that would be any future plans. Uh, this allows the director to come up with conservation plans that address agriculture, irrigation, grandfathered water rights. Um, it prevents water logging, um, many, many different things. So I'll just briefly go through some of this. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing for you. It's 14 pages long. So. Uh, the director shall establish the historic annual net natural recharge for any groundwater replenishment district in an active management area computed by the determining the net natural recharge as defined uh, for a groundwater basin beneath the district during the most recent 30 year period of record and dividing it by 30 to come up with that that figure. Um, Water duty computed for the farm unit under the paragraph using irrigation efficiency is 80%. Um, it also talks about grandfather water rights. It talks about, uh, as I said, water logging so that that does not occur. Um, it, the management plans go to a non per capita conservation program and for city providers uh, and shall require the provider regulated under the program to implement one or more water conservation measures in its service area from the list adopted by the director. And director, maybe you can uh, provide me with what was proposed back then and, and maybe any updates that you have now. Uh, may subscribe the number of conservation measures that a provider must implement based on the number of service connections that they have in the area. The director shall uh, include a non per capita conservation program, a list and description of conservation measures that the city providers uh, are regulated under and must select from the and to comply with the requirements. Um, include in an annual report the current water rate structure. The provider is encouraged to adopt a water rate structure that promotes efficient use of water subject to approval of the, of the Corporation Commission. Um, keep and maintain accurate records verifying that the city provider implemented the conservation measures. It also, uh, the director shall design a program to achieve water use efficiency, establishing a per capita conservation requirements. Uh, 
Uh, it also uh, requires a description of existing service area, water use patterns, description of conservation measures currently implementing and any additional conservation measures the provider intends to implement, how each conservation measure is relevant uh, to the existing service uh, water use patterns. And what the provider will implement at the minimum number of conservation measures required for a conservation program. Uh, it has to be either approved or disapproved by the director. If the director does not approve within 90 days, it's deemed approved. At the director's decision, uh, or the director's decision is a final, is final until the municipal provider submits a provider profile that is accepted by the director. Uh, it's a, it addresses large untreated water providers, small municipal providers, uh, and municipal providers uh, shall comply with individual user requirements. So then uh, it talks about agriculture, alternative agriculture conservation programs. The director shall establish components for a historic cropping program. The management uh, the in the management plan, the director shall establish performance standards. Uh, shall meet both the following conditions: comply with the performance standards established by the director, and not accumulate debt that exceed twenty five percent on a flexibility account. The director may include in the adoption or modification of the plan uh, in the for the six management plan, additional alternative agriculture conservation programs that the director deems achieve, uh, achievable in conservation. The maximum annual groundwater allotment is determined based on the crops grown during a calendar year in which the irrigation efficiency is applied. And the director shall include in the adoption of the management plan uh, a best management practices program. The program shall be designed to achieve conservation that is at least equivalent to required by agricultural conservation program included in the management plan. And there's several other things in, in the bill. Uh, I would ask you to read 1512 and get back to us. Um, right now, we do have the uh, Post 2025 AMA plan uh, and the fifth management plan stays in existence until uh, we act at the legislature. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing back from you as to seeing what uh, recommendations and comments that you had. I know in 2018 we did get several comments. I don't remember what those comments were, but I can pull my records and and and, uh, and review those. But there are, there were other uh, water bills at that time that I'll be reviewing and taking a look at and and getting back with the director and going over them uh, one by one. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, first. Representative Griffin, I will offer that we will post on the council website a copy of the SB um, 1512 from 2018. Um, okay. And if you would like us to post any of the comments you received back then, if you could get them to us, we'd be happy to do that as well. Make it that'd, as simple as possible for folks. That'd be great. Uh, any questions before I, I speak about the DWR proposal? Uh, for Representative Griffin or comments. Boss Aha has something he might. Yep, that. Yes, thanks, Tom. Um, thank you, Senator Griffin. Uh, with all due respect for you uh, having sponsored that bill, I believe we told you then we drastically opposed that measure. That measure was too wide ranging with unintended consequences and that it needed a, and it gave way too much power and latitude in one 
position in state government. And so um, if, if we're going to be looking at that instrument, uh, I would um, uh, propose that we would study it through, you know, one of the study subcommittees or whatever, because it's uh, that that's a pretty far ranging, wide, impactful uh, piece of legislation. Thanks, Bass. Anyone else? Uh, yes. Uh, as Steph would like to make a comment. Who? Uh, S T E F S. Stephanie. Stephanie, small house. Is that your chat box comment that we're butchering? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Sorry. It's, yeah, I'm not sure why it's putting me up as Steph's. But anyway. Um, <laughs> I, uh, no, just a, a quick comment. Um, I, I would agree with Bass and, you know, just to say that I think we've put a considerable amount of time into kind of recovering from the 4th management plan process and working through the 5th management plan. Um, where we've made quite a bit of progress and I think during that time. We have identified um, some issues that. Perhaps uh, definitely need a second look before we create uh, more management plan um, statutory uh, language, especially given the fact that um, the landscape continues to change and and you know the information that we get um, from month to month is is can have quite a drastic impact. So, you know, I would really like to see um, a lot of effort put into at least uh, you know speaking from the agricultural community. An opportunity to really dive into something like that before it uh, before it went too far. So, Stephanie, the changing landscape is a, a very important comment. Um, and again, it, it could cut both ways being tied to what we're doing. The 5th management plan in the changing landscape could be uh, really problematic as well. Uh, but I understand your concern about uh, having a deeper dive and giving the flexibility in the future. Uh, so it's a point well taken. Do we have anyone else? Warren Kenny would like to make a comment. Go ahead, Warren. Thank you, Director. Um, as was noted in my update, we've been, uh, the post-2025 committee identified as one of the issues of to look at the AMA management structure. Um, I, I thought, I believe the, the general sentiment, at least from working both with Tim and with Cheryl, as well as uh, talking with other committee members is that, yes, it, it is important for the department to be able, the department then for the state to be able to continue to have management periods and to have management plans. They are, have been instrumental tools for us as uh, uh, in each of the AMAs and has been very um, beneficial. And so it'd be something that we would certainly want to continue. What, what we've wrestled with in the committee is when's the best time to discuss it? We're looking at, as noted earlier, issues of assured water supply program, unreplenished groundwater withdrawal, hydrologic disconnect. Is it possible that in those discussions, we may also come up with some solutions that would be best administered or best implemented within the, man within the management plans? And so what I did, a, in looking at briefly at Senate Bill 1512 this morning, um, it's not completely clear of how much of what is in the language is um, as done right now by the department or or how much is new and different. Um, and so certainly want to take a look at that. But I, I feel it's really important that these management plans be able to evolve um, as was noted earlier, there's a continually changing landscape and that's why it's gonna be important that we 
we don't just end up with only the fifth management plan as the regu regulatory uh, uh, framework for managing the AMAs. And it will be very important that we are able to evolve and have um, additional management plans. Um, as was noted by Representative Griffin, uh, in the AMAs, there's been a challenge in reaching the management goals for the AMAs. Our proposal was basically that's not necessarily make a lot of change. That is that's not necessarily um, um, not because a lot a lack of trying. There's been a lot of effort to try to meet those management goals, um, both by stakeholders in the AMAs as well as by the department. But I think some of it is uh, is that the the management plans themselves haven't always been um, uh, the management goal and the management plans don't always necessarily um, uh, coincide, especially when you look at unreplenished groundwater withdrawals, an issue that we're wanting to dive into in uh, at our next meeting of the committee of really looking at that because. That's really why the, at least the Phoenix AMA has not been able to meet a safe yield. And so a lot of, a lot of complex issues. And so basically, I think it's important to look at, but I, I certainly want to voice support that we do need to continue to have management periods as well as management plans. Thanks, Warren. And I guess we'll look forward to uh, comments you might provide to us on 1512. Uh, anyone else before I move on? Yeah, yeah Tom, it's uh, Spencer Cam. So I just wanted to, you know, put in our two cents that, you know, we'd have to review 1512, obviously, just like everybody else on the call. And, um, but, you know, this this is a pretty dynamic situation as we go through the post-2025 discussions. And obviously, water is in a state of flux, um, as you mentioned, in Pinal County specifically. And I think we would be, uh, you know, we're going to really scrutinize how we move forward with these management situations and and specifically as it relates to legislative authority and 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 weigh in at the appropriate time, but we do we do have major concerns as this landscape continues to change. Thanks. Thanks, Spencer. Anyone? Yeah. Okay, so I'll I'll briefly talk about the state's proposal from 2018, but I did want to address philosophically when the state was putting this together, I think we moved forward from a point of we weren't suggesting in our proposal to make any major changes to the basic underlying um, deal that was the 1980 Groundwater Management Code. So we weren't, for instance, uh, suggesting that those who have an ability to pump without replenishment, the unreplenishment pumpers that Warren referred to, should suddenly have a replenishment requirement. Our proposal really was about taking the current management plan structure and just carrying it forward uh, in a series of three additional plans, six, seven, and eight. So it was a very simple, conservative approach and really just giving uh, the department the requirement and the ability to do additional plans. And those plans and their creation would then create a situation in which we could tailor those plans to the changing conditions that some of you have brought up, at least under the regulatory authority that the director and the department currently has under the statutes. So again, that was simply our conservative approach, three additional periods, uh, basically carrying for, forward the existing regulatory requirements and elements of of the management plans and the programs there under. So um, we'll also post uh, what we put together back then. Again, um, it never was put into a, an actual bill that was uh, dropped at the legislature, but we'll post what we have as well. 
So going back to the discussion by Representative Griffin, uh, from my perspective, Representative Griffin, I think once we uh, have a period of time for folks to make comments on uh, your 2018 proposal and ours, perhaps we can talk some more about potential paths forward, again, not not suggesting or trying to step on any ability that you have to move forward any legislation that you might want to move forward next year uh, in the next session. But again, we might coordinate a little bit and decide if we want to have any more discussion with the full council, if we want to have a committee breakout. I hesitate still to refer this issue to the post-2025 AMA committee looking at their workload uh, that Warren went through with us. They have a huge task ahead of them and legislative proposals for the next session are going to be coming forth, I think, before they're going to work through all the issues on their list. Knowing what I've heard about the different views on some of those issues by the stakeholders who participate in that process to date. So, Representative I, Griffin, I, does that sound like a good process to I, you? I agree, Director. Yes, I agree. Um, this legislation came from Ledge Council at my understanding at the request of the department. So, um, yeah, I don't know what other uh, list that you have, but, you know, I'd be happy to, to review it and uh, continue to work with you. And we'll post what we propose and and get you a copy as well. Um, and I couldn't, I, I also do not know or can't remember how some of the other issues that arose in 1512 got there. Um, but I think ours is a simpler version. All right, thank you. So uh, for the council, you heard what, uh, the path forward is on, on this particular issue. Again, as I think Warren related to, we have another year and a half of the governor's tenure. Uh, if we can get there next session on an extension of the management plans in a way that makes sense for the state and obviously we'll need support across large stakeholder groups. I love to see that happen, but at the very least, uh, teeing up this issue, I think, is really important. We will need the flexibility proposed by various commenters on this issue. We will need to be able to change the management plans to the changing conditions. And if we're stuck with the fifth management plan, we won't be able to do that. So, and I understand there's two sides to that coin always, uh, but I, I really want to try to push this forward and at least get this teed up and getting this work done, even if we can, can't get all the way there in the 2022 legislative session. So with that, you see we have about five minutes left in our meeting time. We'll move to the next item. Uh, oh, we have one more comment, go ahead. Kathleen Ferris would like to speak. Go ahead, Kathy, unmute yourself. Still needing to have you unmute yourself. Can we unmute her for her? Am yes. I unmuted now? Here you go. Now you're okay, unmuted. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm very sorry. I, I don't mean to drag this out. I did not exactly know where you were planning to take this. I absolutely agree with you that this is critical for the council to consider. Uh, we are not reaching the management goal of safe yield. And if we care about the sustainability of groundwater in the AMAs, we have to continue the planning process moving forward. So I support what you just laid out and wanted to be on the record of doing that. Thank you. Thank you. So now moving on to the annual report. Uh, we just wanted to let everyone know that the report has been delivered to the governor and the legislators. I want to thank the council members for reviewing and providing feedback electronically. The report is published on our website. Uh, and if any members of the council would like a hard copy of the report, please let our staff know. So with that, we'll move on to the closing remarks. Again, I want to thank everybody for their participation in this meeting. 
Our next scheduled meeting is September 16th, 2021 from 10 to noon. And it is going to be uh, a hybrid in-person and virtual meeting. Uh, we had close to 150 people, I think, online for this meeting. We could not fit 150 people in any room that I have access to in this building. I think one of the great lessons learned during the pandemic in all of the virtual meetings we held is that participation greatly increased in comparison to our in-face, face-to-face meetings prior to the pandemic. And we're committed at DWR for all of our meetings when we go back to face-to-face -face meetings in those public meetings that we have this hybrid uh, system so that we can have as much participation as possible. And I think with that, we're a couple of minutes before 12 and have met our agenda items and kept within the time frame. And I thank everyone again, and I'm starting to see some of you in person. I'm looking forward in September, for those of you who I don't see between now and then in person, to meeting with all of you again face-to-face. -face. Thank you all, and we're adjourned.